All right, everybody, thanks for having me here. Uh, my name is Jacob Maggard of Settled Information Solutions. We're out of Houston, Texas, similar to uh, Todd, who went before. Uh, we focus on oil and gas solutions. My title of my presentation is Creating Commercial Data Products with FME. Um, about Settled, uh, we're, we consider ourselves a, a new breed of uh, geospatial data service provider. So how many in here are familiar with IHS or Drilling Info data products? A number of you, yeah. So we're a small company building those same sort of data sets. So while we do do some uh, service provision consulting, our main bread and butter is building these data products. Um, what we like to do is transform data into actionable information. We, we take our data compilations to the next level rather than throwing data over the fence, sometimes like some of these big stoic data vendors do. We try to build a little bit more intelligence into the data. What that does for us is it allows us to sell GIS as a service. So our qualifications, proven industry experience, uh, part of my bio, I worked 10 years for Shell while we built uh, one of the greatest enterprise GIS systems in the world. Uh, then went to a small operator, uh, told them that I wouldn't accept the job unless they let me buy FME. Um, and then uh, got peeled away from there to go to BP, spent four years there, moved to a position of leading uh, a, an enormous team in charge of all data and information. Um, currently, I'm one of uh, 30, 30 is it? Yes, FME certified professionals in the US. Uh, my company settled. Notice the ETL is underlined. Some people don't, don't catch that right away. Uh, is, a, is one of 16 uh, certified solution providers in the Western Hemisphere. So as I said, we, our, our bread and butter is offering uh, data products, or more so information products. So consulting helps us understand user needs, pays the bills while we build this enormous set of data products. And uh, finally, the, the objective is to, when I worked at a small operator, I realized they couldn't put together a team. Uh, they didn't have the resources on the IT side, on the human side, uh, the budget, the commitment, all wasn't there to build a, a nice, usable enterprise GIS. So this company is designed to offer GIS as a service. So a little, a little outline, creating commercial data products. What does that mean? Hopefully by the end of this session I'll, be, I'll clear that up. So what were our challenges in doing that? Why did we choose FME? Uh, you know, how, a little bit of how we did it, and then uh, what came out the other side. So what was the end product? So a lot of you may say, I don't need to create a commercial data product. I'm happy to read a shapefile, merge it with a spreadsheet, and put it in my SDE every night, and that's all I need. So, but for Settled, what we're trying, what we've set out to do is to rival IHS, Drilling Info, Tobin, any of those companies using today's tools. So I've had the director of development from IHS, former, sitting in my office looking at what I've done with a lot of the automation, the FME, and he says we're worlds ahead. IHS has 50-year-old code they can't change. If I want to add a column, I verify it with my customers, change something Pretty minor in FME, I'm off to the races. So when we go out and talk to folks in industry, we're finding that more and more people are picking up using FME to move data every night. It could be on their laptop. They could be using a task scheduler to read something out of Maximo, join it to uh, a shapefile from a surveyor, and then put it into their SDE to drive maps. But what's happening is it, it's so easy to use FME now and it's so, it's so widespread that there's not a lot of uh, sustainability being uh, looked after. 
So business folks are, are happy. There's a lot of stars being born. Um, I will say like 10 years ago when I was at Shell, I was one of them. So I, I, I started, uh, we started out loading data with Perl scripts, something called JTX that uh, Esri had built to look after the Columbia disaster or something. It was, it was a workbench GUI type of uh, ETL type thing. And FME, I, I chose to use FME, started out with the, the basic scripts, um, started building it to where everything in my team was loaded by FME every night, every week, every quarter. So, whoops. So what I'm saying is IT data governance is often an afterthought, and so we have to kind of look, look at how we can, as professionals that love to use FME, we have to learn to uh, sort of educate management and other peers on how to make the things we build a little bit more transparent and sustainable. So we can't just say the business folks are innovating and, and get out of their way. Uh, we need to build in some sustainability. You don't want to just write a bunch of uh, export output dot shape. Uh, you don't want you don't want to read those. You don't want to do things on your C drive or in an unknown uh, network share. That's not sustainable. So how how do you share this stuff? How do you how do you create sort of a spirit of innovation that everybody can participate in? So for us. We had a lot of challenges. Uh, when you're building something like a land lease, well production, pipe, uh, facilities, activity, uh, a full ENP data set, you got to go to multiple sources to get that information. So governments, uh, we even take from investor presentations, news, uh, we scrape PDFs, we have an automated system that uh, gets 2,500 pieces of news per day, indexes all those words, ranks the words, tells us which piece of news is important. So an example of that is if Chesapeake bought range resources yesterday, I need to know that more than I need to know that Chesapeake stock was upgraded by Motley Fool. Uh, that, <laughs> those, are, those are spam articles. So uh, we use FME for all of that kind of stuff. Uh, then obviously multiple formats. I'm sure all of you know this. Uh, shape file, a lot of ASCII files come down for our Gulf of Mexico job. We, we take a lot of JSON straight from the web. Uh, and then you have your traditional geodatabases, shape files. So then we need to do something. Uh, so structuring the data. So when when we build scripts to pull this data down, where do we put it and what do we call it? And is it sustainable and can my, my FMWs pick it up at the end of the night? Uh, what, are, what are the strategic things we've done there? I'll, I'll show some on the next slide. Uh, as Todd talked about, enrichment is important. So uh, he said if you move the data, make it better. Uh, basically what that means is you have the opportunity to make it better because you're already loading this data you have the opportunity to build in some extra widgets to do math, to classify, to make your data better, turn it, move it closer to information. So a lot of tools are available. We can throw humans at it. We can get interns to use ArcGIS and move data and make models, scripting, pick another language. Um, but we primarily use ArcGIS and FME. I would say that we are 85% FME on our, our data loading processing processes, and the other 15 is uh, combinations of batch, Python, uh, some JavaScript. So what that all, all those things we just talked about is, is to me, it, it can be looked at as a steaming pile of manure. It's, it's very hard to deal with, it may stink, it may take a lot of time. So what we chose to do is, is take it out one scoop at a time. So solve problems, one, one bucket load at a time. 
And so we use an FME tractor for that uh, with the lizard driving. Uh, but, but there's a lot of standardization that we do. To, uh, we have a lot of internal policy that I didn't, all my experience at Shell and BP, that was lovely, but uh, at Shell and BP, you're taking an IHS data set or something that's already clean and maybe enriching it a little bit and maybe merging it with your internal data. But I'm stepping one level back now. I'm stepping to a totally uh, sort of disparate world where you're, you're taking things from sources that don't care why, they don't care what kind of format you want coming out. So it can be a government putting it out for one reason and another agency does a totally different thing. So we chose FME to handle that because of, you know, in this day and age, there are greater expectations on what you do with data in your organizations. Everyone in here is here because you you know a little bit more than the average accounting guy on uh, where data is sourced from, how we should process it, and how we can get better value out of our business information. So um, basing our business on unsupported open source tools would be difficult. FME's price point, FME's uh, number of formats, uh, also, the, the, just the team, Miles, uh, the whole team uh, at FME is, is very supportive. You call in, you ask for a modification of the software, you point out a bug. It's, it's a very uh, open environment. They're, they're happy to, to take advice and to help you come up with a better solution. So as I said before, um, anybody can start with FME. So we've, we've got other folks at my, my team, in my team that are just are just starting, so they begin with you know, point to point uh, data movements or QCs. Um, me personally, I moved on to enriching data, and uh, kind of later in my career at BP, we rebuilt an entire enterprise GIS with FME at the core. So, what I mean by that is, when I was at Shell, we had a data loading team that had eight folks. When we went to BP. The system design allowed us to have one person. His name is Jeffrey Vu, real nice guy. I trained him up. He's still there. Um, one guy in that business unit, largest business unit in BP, uh, with a backup. So th that's sort of some of the things you could do with FME if you uh, plan correctly. So like I said, now uh, I'm stepping further back into the process, hoping to change the world a little bit to, I guess, offer uh, cost-effective data products to oil and gas companies. We will move beyond oil and gas. We've started there because that's my experience. Um, but I really enjoy taking uh, all the puzzle pieces, all this data out in the, in the world and making it more usable, flowing it out to end-use uh, applications. So our foundation, here is a, an example. So. Some things we've standardized uh, over time, these, these standards didn't just come out. I think I was about to say that earlier, is all that experience I've, I've had didn't, didn't help me you know, come out with standards that we're gonna follow from here out. It was more like, okay, let's build something, and then we had to keep changing the standards. How, how do we store data? What does our, our file system look like? How do I know uh, where this data will end up, where it should be deposited to be read? then where are the FMWs, what are they named, and why does that matter? So you see our file structure down on the left, uh, name of the company, scope, extract, transform, load, disseminate, settled. Um, you know, scope is obvious, what are we doing? So if I've got an idea to build a Mexico ENP data product, I may go find some links on Google and drag those links into that folder, and at some point we'll start to figure out how we can flow that data. Uh, extract is where the inputs go to, to be read. Uh, transform is where our FMWs go. Uh, we have QC outputs as well. I call them dog legs. It's uh, say if you had a feature merger and the unmerged and you need to keep an eye on that, I would spit that out as a CSV. Uh, that's a QC. So load is where we, we store stage deliverables. Uh, our company can sell 
GIS as a service on the web or uh, straight up thick data like file geodatabases. So that has to go somewhere uh, to be staged. Disseminate, where we store our maps, layers, those types of things to publish our web GI, our, our uh, REST services. On the right, you see we have this uh, highlighted column. It's, it's uh, a system of uh, sort of in the middle of the feature classes and tables, we've got an identifier that's going to help us with something. So you see there's, there's numbers, Ds, Ws, ZM, ZQs, and we'll get to that in a minute. So to innovate with FME, it, you can start with the point-to-point -point solutions. Uh, we've moved to quick prototyping, so if we want to understand if the data, if some data is, is usable, if it's good data that we should, uh, say, in, ingest and put together as part of a Mexico data product, we will prototype the data in FME first. Uh, then obviously we have uh, production jobs that I'll get to. Uh, the, the, beauty, the best thing I love about FME is we can revise as we learn more. So we learn more about the data, we can add a new column. We hear more from our customer that uh, we need a classification on what type of, is it subsea infrastructure or, or surface infrastructure. Uh, we can do some deductions, make that calculation. That drives a symbology in our web map uh, those are the types of enrichment and betterment we have the opportunity to do back in our raw, what, what most would consider a raw data set. So we're largely moving toward information. And then systems QC, we'll get to here. So formats, uh, classifications, I just gave an example. We can deduce statuses. Uh, one example of that is uh, has a lease ever had production in it? So that's, that's good to, to understand. If you're, if you're going into a lease sale, has there ever been any production in that lease or anything near it? And what does it look like? So we, we deduce all of that and we roll it back into our, our blocks and leases. Circular reference is, is sort of another way to say that. So I write out my production, I then when I write my blocks the next time, I refer to the production and build that answer into those blocks. So it's a circular reference. Uh, we use FME to prioritize work. Uh, there's a guy at my office this morning that received uh, a number of Slack posts uh, starting at say 1 a.m. to right when he comes in at about 7 a.m. Uh, various things are happening. He gets a list of the top 50 news articles from yesterday, and he takes those and offers a little bit of humanistic touch to them. They're then spatialized with FME tonight, and they show up in the map tomorrow. So we use FME heavily for marketing summaries. So if you want to know, uh, say you, you're interested in our, our CI product, you want to know how many different companies do we track? How many different uh, production rates do we have for the Permian Basin? I can tell you all that because it comes out every night in an email with an Excel sheet attached that tells you everything you want to know. It's an Excel sheet with 10 tabs in it and it says all of that. The who, the what, the when, the where, the where what, the, they're just all, it's all tabbed out. We also have uh, sort of internal QCs that go on the same way with a tab spreadsheet. So, I guess my point is uh, QAQC can be fun with FME. It's usually not something we think of as fun, but uh, we're rather, we're, we're enjoying Slack notifications. Uh, there's some examples there. Um, I, I have a module that I stick in the end of all of our production jobs that is uh, uh, basically, it's modular. You don't have to change anything. You just hook it up uh, from your feature writers, of course. Hopefully everybody's tried a feature writer. Uh, feature writer has the opportunity to do something after you've written. That something is, uh, for us, is, is to uh, run into that module, uh, send an email, post to Slack, and also write to a custom um, monitoring, uh, QC monitoring table that I have done that is, uh, looks something like this. So this is in our office. 
This is up 24-7. Uh, the yellow is telling me that something's going to happen soon. The green is saying those things are good. Uh, essentially, it's a job duration variance. So we have a, you know, how long did this job take to run the last seven times it ran? And what's the variance between the last time it ran today? And then also for counts. So what was the feature count the last seven times this ran? And what is it today? And those all add up and go into a logarithmic ranking scale and tell us whether something is a little bit abnormal. Um, it's quite fun. Uh, once you get used to it, the sort of the noise, I, I've had folks tell me, uh, Jeffrey from BP, uh, he said, well, I, I only want to know the errors. I don't want to know everything. I've taken a different approach. I want to know everything. I want to know when the job started. I want to know what it did. I don't want to just know errors. I want to know all of it. And you get used to it, and it becomes fast for you to, to understand. So tips and tricks for us. Um, earlier, there was something in one of the slides that uh, I, I forgot to mention, but I'll do it here. Uh, you need to you change file system. You change your file system, your standards. You you rename a folder, uh, and you've got 35 FMWs. Uh, you don't go in there and to each FMW and well you can, but uh, what we do and it may not be supported is uh, open all of them in Notepad plus plus. Do a find replace save all. Uh, we're good to go. Um, again, probably not supported completely, um, but it's very fast. And it makes it uh, sort of so you get off your hands. And, and if you need to change the folder structure, do it. It's, it's, you got that option. So uh, tips and tricks, harvesting JSON is one of our favorites. Uh, we find, uh, you search Google, uh, Keith Fraley did a talk at like 10 years ago, 12 years ago. That was uh, the Hitchhiker's Guide uh, for the web, for GIS for the web. And it was uh, you know, searching Google ArcGIS REST and whatever you're looking for. Can be, a, can be a domain, it can be a data type, ArcGIS, REST, something. Find the, find the server, harvest it with FME. Um, we have also used FME to make other FMWs. Again, not supported. This one's probably less supported. Uh, when we needed to make thousands of substring extractors, we used FME to make the code that we then put inside another FMW to do all of that for us. Um, other things, uh, tips, feature writer uh, allows you to write something and then continue your process. Feature writer, for example, when I want to sort uh, 20 million rows, many of you probably don't deal with 20 million rows, but please use 64-bit if you're gonna use 20 million rows. And also, uh, if you want to sort, that sorter is going to take about four hours to sort. And so the, the solution we use is to write it out as a CSV into a staging area and uh, sort it upon read. And that knocks it down to about 30 minutes or 20 minutes maybe. So even writing that entire CSV, reading it all back, sorting it, you save three and a half hours. So uh, there's yeah, various tips like that. So what we're talking about today is this lower left quadrant, basically. Um, so I had to build this for Esri. I'm, a, I'm in the Esri startup program, uh, and, and they continually you know, want to know what I'm offering them in terms of innovation. And they want to know what, what am I using the free software for that they give me. And so I had to explain, you know, we harvest disparate data, we process it, I kind of had to throw some model builder stuff in there for them, and a little bit of Python. But like I said, 85% of what we do is FME. So we publish, we render thick data upward, provide that. We, we also publish to the web. We can do both. So what do those solutions look like? So as they come out, this data is loaded daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, as needed, uh, just like anybody else's data, IHS, I've said 40 times probably, but this, this is our Gulf of Mexico data product. It's a complete ENP data set. Uh, we have a, we put out a story map for the latest lease sale. Uh, we've got a Brazil data product as well. They've got a, a bid round coming up. Uh, we've got a 
North American land compilation that is the basis for uh, some things we're doing with onshore data. We're, we plan to have an onshore data product relatively shortly. And this is our competitive intelligence slide. It's a little messy, sorry about that. Uh, where we take investor presentations, news, financials, straight from the SEC. Uh, we do a little bit of human stuff. We reference a spatial library. We spatialize with FME. And it all comes down in a custom application with a map and various charting on the side for things like drilling cost in the Bakken. You want to know every time somebody said how much it costs to drill a well in the Bakken, we have that information. And this is a little bit closer look at that. So uh, we've got reserves, land holdings, all those things. And it's, it's referenced straight to the presentations. So uh, basically, that's all I had for you. Um, we are in the progress of building some onshore US data products. We should have those done by the end of the summer, as long as I quit taking one week off to come to Vancouver. <laughs> but uh, after, after one year, uh, we've been in business for 13 months. The strategy is working. So the whole purpose of this talk was to, I guess, give you a little bit of confidence that FME is sustainable. Um, you know, when you upgrade versions, uh, they've been very kind to, to keep things working for you. Old transformers still reference uh, the same engines and things. Uh, we're going to continue down the path we're on. So we plan to build data products for all over the world. Um, hopefully this comes up. But uh, any questions? Yeah, so um, I will admit that uh, for production workspaces, we try not to change them too much. Um, uh, we do have a lot of documentation, so we have it both within the workspace and then we have uh, sort of a write-up sheet for each of our workspaces that says, you know, what is this for? Uh, who built it and when? Um, but yeah, we, there's always a challenge there, you know, who, who, who made a change, when, what did they do? And a lot of times, I will be frank with you, it's, a, it's an annotation I add that says, you know, here's a bookmark, the stuff in here I changed on May 20th. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And and so in layman's terms, I I do them. So uh, anything that anything I need a a junior person to do, uh, we take it offline. They test it. Maybe it's these days it's more of a module replacement or something like that rather than an entire sort of washout of the of the workspace. So thank okay. Jacob for his time today. Thank and you. And for taking time out of his whole week to come, uh, come to that.